Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Robert Bell. Thank you for looking in on this event uh, filmed um, for Highlands Homecoming 2020. During the normal school year, I do a series of lectures on original printmaking, covering a wide range of topics from specific artists to movements and techniques used in original printmaking. Um, because of the pandemic, uh, we were unable to have the usual format for these lectures where we meet in Kennedy Hall and pass prints around and look at them in close detail. When Renee asked me to do this um, virtual talk, I said, what topic would you like? And she said, anything you choose. And I thought, well, wonderful, it's 2020. What better than prints on the apocalypse? such as Durer's uh, image of the four horsemen and so on and so forth. But um, after thinking about it, however, I decided that we really didn't need apocalyptic images uh, over seven centuries, and uh, we should have something more upbeat. So I changed the topic to a lecture on children, kittens, and puppies, or kids, cats, and canines. And so instead, we are going to look at images depicting these subjects from the 1400s up to the 21st century. So we're going to look at seven centuries of original prints. In Western art, the earliest dated image comes from 1423, an image uh, entitled the Buxheim St. Christopher. The artist is unknown, but it's an image of the Christ child. Um, being carried across the uh, river to visit a hermit and carried by St. Christopher. The Christ child is a child depicted in most original prints up through the 1700s. I love this image particularly because it has a little bunny rabbit sticking its head out of the, its house in the uh, lower right. In the next image, we have one of Durer's most famous images, Night, Death, and the Devil. Um, the dog, in this case, is the faithful companion uh, following the Christian knight as he heads toward his castle on the hill, probably re representing um, heaven. He's um, pursued by death on the left, holding the hourglass, and the devil holding the spear. The image is full of other um, symbols that we could discuss for an hour, but that will come in another lecture. Um, in our next image, if we jump to the uh, 1600s, we have the Christ child again in a Rembrandt etching entitled The Rest <clears throat> on the Flight to Egypt, where Joseph and Mary are carrying the infant Jesus to Egypt to escape Herod's order of uh, killing all newborn male children. Rembrandt, um, it's now known as one of the most famous etchers of all time, depicted not only religious scenes, but images of peasants. And one of my favorite images entitled The Pancake Lady, where a woman is making pancakes for sale in the marketplace. There's a woman holding a baby on her lap in the background. But the center of the image is the little child who's trying to keep his pancake being eaten by the dog that's pursuing the child. If we go to the 1700s, um, the uh, Spanish artist Francisco Goya, uh, who had been known as a court painter, out of the blue in 1799 offered for sale one of the most incredible series of etchings in the history of printmaking called the Caprichos. This first image is um, from that series entitled The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters, and we have the artist asleep at his uh, desk. We know it's the artist and it shows his etching and engraving tools. And uh, the cat in this picture is not your benevolent little lap cat. It's the companion of witches and goblins in the lower right. At the same time that um, in the 1790s, while Goya was working on those that series of etchings, in Germany, a German named uh, Senefelder invented a new technique called lithography. It was developed for commercial purposes, 
but it was rapidly adapted uh, by artists to do original artwork in multiples. Uh, one of the um, early uh, French artists who took up lithography um, was a man named Charlet, who did numerous images of um, the peasants and also another favorite subject was Napoleon. But this is an example, one of his early lithos from around 1820, showing a young girl offering one of her apples to a poor homeless man. One of the things I love about these early images is they were done before photography was available. And so we get an insight into what country schools look like, for example. This uh, lithograph by Cholet has the uh, caption, um, teacher, may we all have severe headaches, may we all leave. Also notice that uh, in the French village schools, the dunce cap was replaced by a hat that had donkey ears on it. Charlet was one of the persons who experimented with the different effects you could get with lithography. And he um, was one of the persons who experimented with touche, where you liquefied the litho drawing crayon. And you could paint it on the stone and get these dense blacks as in this lithograph of the head of a dog. And if you look closely, you can see that the whiskers and hairs were achieved by scraping with a sharp knife um, to give you these fine white lines. Another <clears throat> early French lith artistic lithographer was Horace Vernet. We have his portrait, an example of one of his lithographs. Um, you have two soldiers who were out hunting. The French Napoleonic soldiers were often short of food and would um, shoot whatever they could to eat. You can see an animal roasting on the spit. And, uh, one of the soldiers is holding up the pelt of the animal and the woman's looking at it and saying, that's not a rabbit, that's my cat. But by far the greatest lithographer of the 19th century was Honoré Daumier, who did over 4,000 lithographs covering a very wide range of subjects <clears throat> from child discipline to uh, politics to um, battles between the sexes and on and on. In this image, simply called la touche or the touch, it shows a cranky old lady disciplining a young child. You note the similarity between the previous Goya uh, image. Of note in this lithograph is the portrait of Napoleon in the background. It was Napoleon who introduced the Napoleonic Code of Laws, some of which had extremely strict consequences for breaking them. Daumier did a series of lithos on education and school children. So another one, the caption for this one is uh, how a great mathematician is made. He did another series called The Bathers, and here we have families swimming in the Seine, some enjoying it more than others. Another series was called Hours of the Day, in which he depicted a bachelor and his two companions, a little dog and a cat. In the first one at eight in the morning, they're having breakfast together. There are several more in the series, but I'm just showing two. And the last one is nine o'clock at night. And they're all calling it a day, and he's about to put out the candle. If you notice, the rays from the candle are done by the same technique of finally scratching a line on the litho stone. In the next Daumier series that we're showing, it's called La Chasse or the Hunt. And <clears throat> this is a classic Daumier making fun of the hunters. Uh, here we have an unsuccessful hunter and his poor bedraggled dog who's been running around the fields with him all day and not able to shoot anything. And he notices a man up on the hill. The caption reads, oh, my brave man, how much for your rabbit? The man on the hill says, four francs. And the hunter says, I'll give you five francs if you hold it just like that and let me shoot it. One of his famous series was Les Bas Bleu, which was the uh, French for the blue stockings, which was the name for the uh, women who were members of the women's livers. And in this image, we have a 
a woman's liver going out the door and saying, I'm going to be back quite late. Don't wait up for me. Be sure you feed the baby at least twice. And if you need anything else, you'll probably find it under the bed. Goodbye. So <clears throat> while Daumier was uh, doing his 4,000 lithographs in France between the 1830s and 1870s in the United States, uh, artistic lithography was also catching on. One of the largest public uh, publishers of um, lithographs was the firm of Courier Knives, um, two men who started a litho firm in New York. And they did mainly black and white lithographs, <clears throat> which were all subsequently hand colored by uh, stay at home moms who were given stacks of 100 of the same lithograph and they were paid about a penny to color them. This is a typical Courier Knives. Uh, depicting two children on the farm looking at the newly hatched chickens. Another American artist, <clears throat> uh, Winslow Homer, is well known as a painter and watercolorist of landscapes and seascapes, but he actually started his artistic career as an illustrator of um, journals and newspapers in the United States. He would do a pen and ink drawing on thin tissue paper, which would be put on an ingrain block and used to, and then carved by a professional wood engraver for an illustration in the newspaper. And here we have some examples. On the left is self-portrait of him sketching in the countryside. And then the other two images show children playing uh, outdoor games and activities in the days before they had television, Game Boy, social media, <laughs> and so on. Another American illustrator was Thomas Nast, who was born in Germany, but came to the United States as a young man and uh, also did illustrations for newspapers. He's most famous for his boss Tweed political cartoons, but um, people may also um, not realize that he was the um, portrayer of what is now known as the modern day a uh, chubby, friendly Santa Claus with a pipe in his mouth is depicted in this um, annual Christmas image he would do for Harper's Weekly. Back in Europe in the 18, late 1840s and 1850s, an artist named Charles Jacques began what was, became known as the French etching revival, where etching was taken up again as a fine art form. Um, Jacques was a friend of Millet and one of the members of the Barbizon School and did a number of etchings depicting uh, the farm peasants working in their yard. And here we see a typical farming family with all the family members involved in um, their daily duties, a little child minding the geese, um, the feeding of the chickens, another child working on something in the other corner and the mother feeding her child. In the next image, we see that occasionally the children made their parents take a break from their farm labors and pull the kids around in the, their wagon, toy wagon. <clears throat> the most famous artist of the Barbizon School was Jean-Francois Millet, and <clears throat> who also did a number of prints, both etchings and lithographs. This is an etching he did simply called Gruel. It shows the peasant mother blowing on a spoonful of the porridge to cool it before feeding it to her infant. The etching revival spread from France to England, and that was mainly uh, due to two artists, James McNeil Whistler, the American, and his brother-in-law, Sir Francis Seymour Hayden, the British surgeon, who was also an amateur etcher. Um, Whistler left the United States at age 21, came to France uh, to study art, <clears throat> and published his first set of etchings called 12 Etchings After Nature, also known as the French set, around 1859. This etching is the title page uh, to that set, and it's a self-portrait of Whistler doing some uh, sketching, and he's surrounded by uh, street children. Um, a lot of prints have interesting stories behind them, and this is one. And if you notice at the bottom of the print, he's dedicated the French set to his old friend, Seymour Hayden. This is a rare first state of this. Uh, shortly after the series was published, uh, Whistler and Hayden got into an argument in a French cafe and Whistler threw Hayden through a plate glass window out into the street. 
And uh, Whistler then went back and scratched out his dedication on this plate. Since subsequent states don't have the dedication on the bottom. Whistler became one of the most prominent <clears throat> etchers of the 19th century. It was often compared to Rembrandt, although he didn't like this comparison. And at a party, and reportedly at a party one night, when a woman came up and said, I think you and Rembrandt are two of the best etchers who ever lived, Whistler replied, no need to mention Rembrandt, my dear. But and the first etching on the left is from the French series, and you can see it looks very much like a Rembrandt etching with lots of cross hatching. It's a portrait of little Arthur, one of Sir Francis Seymour Hayden's children. The etching on the right, called the Mem's Children, was done um, almost 30 some years later. And uh, you can see the difference in the styles. Uh, the etching on of the Mem's Children was uh, done when uh, Whistler went over to Mortimer Mem's house for dinner one night and uh, took out an etching plate and made the children sit in the backyard while he did this quick sketch. Mortimer Mepps was the Australian artist who came to study in England and helped Whistler publish his Venice series. By the 1890s, Whistler was almost exclusively working in uh, lithography to do his fine art prints. This is a typical example of one of his lithographs called The Nursemaids in the Garden of uh, Luxembourg in Paris. And it shows the nursemaids with their young charges uh, enjoying the fresh air in the Jardin du Luxembourg. In the 1800s, as the Impressionist movement was getting underway, virtually all the Impressionists, um, except for Monet, made original prints. And um, Manet, who did one of the uh, most discussed pictures of the Impressionist movement, meant Olympia also did an original etching after his own painting. And um, you may not notice right off, but <clears throat> in this etching, there's also a black cat, probably representing evil, because the figure um, pictured is um, almost certainly a prostitute. But the black cat is hidden over in the lower right-hand side of the etching. However, in the later Subsequent etching, Monet featured a typical domestic cat. The etching in Aquitaine is entitled the, um, the Chateau Fleur, the cat in the flowers. And another image of just a child with his dog called Le Gamin, or the young child. Mary Cassatt <clears throat> was um, the only American and one of the only women to exhibit regularly with the French Impressionist. She's noted for her pastels and paintings of women and their children. She also did a number of original prints. And here we have two dry points of um, one is entitled Denise holding her child and the other is called The Mirror. The other most <clears throat> famous woman in the French Impressionist was Bert Morceau. Um, <clears throat> who was married to Edouard um, Manet's brother. Um, she kept her name for her painting. And this is a dry point etching of uh, her self-portrait giving her daughter Julie Manet a drawing lesson and a separate dry point of uh, Julie uh, Manet holding the uh, family's kitten. The etching revival continued uh, actively in France and England and the rest of Europe into the early 1900s. And here we have a dry point by Gaston Latouche, a French artist. Um, I just think it's a lovely etching of a girl holding her uh, little kitten. And if you look closely, you can see the kittens pretending to sleep, but one eye is open looking at the artist. And another Artist not well known today, but very popular in the early 1900s in England was a British artist known, um, whose name was William Lee Hankey. He was British, but he spent his summers on the coast of France in Normandy uh, doing dry point <coughs> of Norman women and their children. This one's entitled The Book, and the next one is entitled The Cloak, 
And um, you can see many of these artists were influenced by Whistler. And one of the things Whistler did in his later etchings would be to concentrate on one part of the etching and hear the face of the mother and the child and the rest of the image was left rather open. So <clears throat> leading up to the French Impressionists and the um, revolution in color lithography, um, we need to briefly discuss Japanese color woodcuts, which <clears throat> came into Europe in the um, 1850s, early 1860s, not as objects of art, but as packing material for uh, the Japanese porcelain. Uh, people unwrapping the porcelain realized that these were in fact wonderful uh, works of art. And some of the people who noticed this early on were the Impressionist artists. And the Japanese color woodblocks played a definite influence on the compositions of the Impressionists and later the, what you'll see in the French color posters. We have two examples of uh, Japanese color woodcuts. If you notice on one, the woman with the kimono, there's a little kitten hiding from the puppy. And then two puppies, the image is called Happy Welcomers of Snow. <laughs> so Jules Charest is uh, often referred to as the father of French color lithography and the um, color poster. He started a poster a lithography, color poster lithography shop and got artists such as Toulouse-Lautrec and um, Mucha and Steinlin uh, to do posters advertising various products and cabarets and events. Uh, this is one of Charest's own posters advertising Dubonnet and what's more fun than drinking Dubonnet with a cat on your lap. So <clears throat> two of the most famous cat posters in history were done by Theophile Steinland. And we have the two posters, the Le Cour Sterilise, with the young girl drinking some pure milk and the cats looking on, hoping for a taste. And then the uh, Chat Noir on the right, this other famous cat poster. The story behind the Chat Noir is um, a person named Sally was um, remodeling a French building for a cabaret. And as he was, they were remodeling, this scrawny, rough black cat came crawling out and Sally adopted it and uh, named his cabaret after it became famous as the name of one of the more notable cabarets in Paris. Edward Penfield is credited with bringing the color poster to the United States and he did many posters for such publications as Harper's. Going back to Europe, we showed um, some prints by one of the most famous German artists, Kate Kolwitz, who was mainly a printmaker. Um, she did um, lots of drawings and studies for her prints, but the final product was usually a finished lithograph or an etching or a woodcut. And those of you who know her know that many of her images are not cheerful mother and children, but the theme of today's lecture is supposed to be a happy one. So we're going to show two of her images, lithograph done around 1960 of a mother and child, and another image, an etching of a mother feeding her child. Although she's often discussed with the German expressionists, she actually never showed with the German expressionists and was not particularly fond of their work. An artist who did influence the German expression was Edward Munch, which you would not guess from this print. Most People are more familiar with his paintings, drawings, and woodcuts of the screen, uh, but this is simply a little called Kinderkopf, a little dry point done of a young girl's head. Max Pechstein was one of the uh, early members of the Bruca, the first German expressionist group. And this image I chose of a mother uh, feeding her child because it shows the influence of African art on the early uh, German Expressionists. If we jump ahead into the 20th century, we have one of the greatest printmakers of that century, Pablo Picasso. And I chose this image of his son, Claude, done in 1950 uh, in lithography. And if you look closely, you can see this image was done by dipping his finger in the touche and applying it, the whole image is done with fingerprints. 
Pablo Picasso once said, when I was a child, I could already draw like Delacroix, but it took me the rest of my life to be able to draw like a child. When I started collecting uh, prints from Associated American artists in the 60s and 70s, I found this artist, Nizhdovsky, who was a Ukrainian, uh, moved to America, who had this very distinctive style of uh, doing woodcuts, these symmetrical patterns uh, in the design. And here is his self-portrait woodcut and an image called, simply called Tabby Cat. Looking now at some New Mexico artists, we have Zara Kriegstein and her self-portrait called Soulmates. And on her left shoulder is her parrot, that she called Loretta, and on her right shoulder, her pet cat, that she simply called Kata. And uh, of course, her other soulmate was her husband, depicted in a locket, Felipe Cabeza de Vaca. So when I came to Santa Fe in the 1980s, um, I had been collecting prints for many years, but I had not actually uh, seriously made any. And I met Joel Green, who had a, his etching studio. Joel had trained with Lazansky at University of Iowa. He's a wonderful printmaker, as well as a painter. And he was giving lessons in uh, printmaking, mainly intaglio printmaking. And uh, so, as I was learning to make prints, we decided at one point to see who could make the most ferocious looking cat. The Joel's is the image on the left and mine's on the right, and we decided it was probably a draw. Another New Mexican printmaker is Pamela Wesselick. He did this amusing little etching called Homework, which has a cat yawning over the book. I can imagine how many students doing in-home learning these days feel the same way as that cat. I'd like to finish with an image by Eli Levin, who is um, one of the founders of um, the Highlands uh, collection of uh, mainly New Mexico painters and one of the uh, persons who helped start the annual New Mexico Invitational uh, Painters Exhibition and who also very generously has the uh, purchase prize, the Eli Levin purchase prize for the New Mexico Painters Show each year. This is one of his many etchings called Midnight Companion, which shows a woman with her cats done in etching in aqua tint. So with that etching, we will end this uh, brief trip through seven centuries of original printmaking featuring uh, children, kittens, and puppies. And Hopefully, this is more upbeat than a lecture on the apocalypse. <laughs>